from New York, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Now, once more, we are about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor is beginning to look forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Harris. <laughs> it certainly can. And tonight I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes, and I've heard that Cleopatra was a break top, too, and she certainly had very few dull moments. And now, Dr. Watson, shall we get back to our story? Yes, indeed. Well, tonight I have decided to tell you the story of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League? What a curious title. <laughs> no more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes' life. One day, it was during the autumn of the year 1890, I burst in upon my friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair it has ever been my privilege to observe. I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But, Holmes, I was afraid you were engaged. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me, Mr. Wilson, this is my friend and helper, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, sir? Oh, how do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations, we must go to life itself. Well, you know, I... Mr. Have... Jabez Wilson here has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular I've listened to for some time. Dear me. Now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. As soon as I can find that newspaper clipping, now where'd I put it? In my... I could have sworn it was in my waistcoat. Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. Well, really, you know... Uh... Well, let me see. I would say he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying. And, uh, well, he has red hair. Oh, obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I will come to your assistance. He has at some time done manual labor. He's a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Well, Mr. Holmes, you're fair. Give me the creeps. Are, are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all that about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I began as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry, you wear a square and compass type in. Oh, I see that. But, but the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cuff, so very shiny? And the left sleeve with a smooth patch near the elbow, where you rest it on the desk. Well, uh, 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 about China... The fish that you've had tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. <laughs> well, well, I never. At first, I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see there's nothing to it after all. Mm, I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining... Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course. What reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I've got it now. It was, it was in my watch pocket. This is what began it all, sir. You just read it for yourself. Watson, suppose you do that for us. Yes, with pleasure. First, make a note of the paper and the date. It's the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890. It was just two months ago. Very well. Proceed with the advertisement. It begins to the Red-Headed League. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 years are eligible. Well, that's very odd. 
A prime person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. Dear me, Holmes, what on earth does this mean? I think I promised you that this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you'll continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I have a small pawnbroker's shop at Coburg Square. Of late years, the business has been pretty bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only keep one. I'd have a job to pay him, only he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. And I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. But, well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to go putting ideas into his head? Yeah. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. He only has one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Snapping away with his camera, then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, eh? He's still with you, I suppose. Oh, yes, sir. An observing young fellow he is. He was the one that brought this advertisement to my notice. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on my office door with this very paper in his hand. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Wilson, sir. Oh, that's you, Vincent. Well, what's the matter? You look excited. Oh, I wish to the Lord, Mr. Wilson, I was a red-headed man. Why that? Well, look here, sir. What it says in this paper. There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. The Red-Headed League? I never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? Oh, Mr. Wilson. A new eligible for one of the vacancies. <laughs> huh? Oh, what are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year. But the work is slight and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. Yeah, a couple of hundred uh, pounds a year, you say? Here, let me see that paper, young man. Oh, here you are, sir. You see, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. And he left his fortune in the hands of the trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. And from what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Yeah, but there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not so many as you might think, sir. You see, it's uh, it's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it's no use if your hair is uh, light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. Well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, uh, I have seen a few that I consider redder. What? Nonsense. Here, where's my hat? Well, uh, what are you going to do, Mr. Wilson? I'm going around to apply for that vacancy. If it was raining gold, no one can say that Jabez Wilson is a man to go out with a sieve. And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of air that can touch mine for redness, if I do say it myself. <laughs> There was thousands competing. And what was the work? Well, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All, all, all I had to do was to sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And how long did this work continue? Oh, about eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture and the like. Then suddenly it came to an end. I went to my work, ten o'clock as usual. The door was shut and locked and a card was nailed on the door. What did it say? The Red-Headed League dissolved September 27th, 1890. But I say, Holmes, that's today. This very morning it was, sir. Well, I, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Uh, four pounds a week's four pounds, you know. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I inquired from the renting agent, and he gave me the man's name and said that he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course? Yes, sir. Well? Well, when I got to that address, it was a, a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. And no one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me? Yes, sir. I, I thought it best not to lose any time. Quite right. By the way, Mr. Wilson, this assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? Oh, uh, about a month. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement. Was he the only applicant? No, sir. Oh, I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? 
Uh, because he was anti- and, and would come cheap, at half wages, in fact. Hmm. What's he like? Uh, small, stout built, uh, very quick in his ways. No air on his face, though he's not short of 30. Uh, and he has a, a white splash of acid on his forehead. Hmm, I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? For... Oh, yes. He says a gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, what day of the week is it? Why, Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop around sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of Saxe Coburg Square. Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. seems to be saxe Coburg Square. Hmm. Shabby, genteel little backwater of a place. This, I fancy, is our friend's shop. The four-story building with the three gilt balls over it. Yes, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, eh? Yes, very depressing. Let's see what street backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Well, uh... Can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem, if it is a problem. Well, the whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which costs its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Now, let me see. What's the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First, we have Mortimer's. Then the tobacconist, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarlane's Carriage Works. Yes, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. Oh, what's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. I found out all I want to here. Holmes, you act as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? It's just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. Rubbish. Well, here they are, back again. Why are you thumping on the pavement with your cane, Holmes? If you want to enter the shop, why not knock on the door? Yes, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately, so just to please you, I will knock on the door. I see. Someone's coming on the double. Looks like our bright little assistant. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, won't you step in? Thank you, no. I only wish to ask you how to go from here to the Strand. Uh, third right, fourth left. Smart fellow, that, eh, Watson? Oh, I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mind in London. As for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? No, what about them? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, oh, this is so much balderdash. I just about had enough of it. I'm going to have myself a, a cup of coffee and some cake. There's an appetizing little big shop across the way. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. Oh. This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> Ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Oh. Ah, here comes the cab. Yes, I think he'll be in it. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Look here, Holmes. Why do you have to rout me out on a night like this? 
Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber of whist. It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years I've not had my whist. My dear Meriwether, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. But come, we must hurry. Oh, I beg your pardon. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How How do you do, do, sir? This way, gentlemen. But where are we going? Mr. Wilson's shop is here on the square. Stop burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher and forger. John Clay? Who is he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colourful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. I've heard that his grandfather was a duke. And he himself had been educated in Oxford and Eton. Yes, he'll crack a crib in Scotland Yard one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been on his track for years, Mr. Holmes, and have never set eyes on him. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are. Down this narrow passageway. you better let me go first. Look here, Holmes, I... I don't like the looks of this at all. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. I say, I've run into something. The wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks so much. Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll unlock the door for us. Uh, Just a moment till I find my key. Mm. Here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Yes. The coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Holmes, I don't like the look of this place. Your lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. The basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend Mr. Merriweather here is president. But what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. You see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. France? Of all things. Most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for any thief. Oh, really, Mr. Holmes, I think you're rather unduly excited. After all, the building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Or from below, Mr. Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that, Mr. Bellamana. You want to ruin all our plans? But, but look here, I say, it did sound hollow. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Yes. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear Watson. This crate contains no less than 2,000 golden Napoleons, neatly packed in tinfoil. Good heavens. Are you ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear. And I brought a deck of cards with me. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We're dealing with a dangerous man. And unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, Watson, close in swiftly. And if he reaches for his gun, shoot. And shoot to kill. Oh, dear me. I wish I'd stayed at home. Quiet. I'm going to cover the light. to imagine all sorts of horrors sitting here in the dark like this. Quiet, Merriweather. Holmes, did you hear that? Look, there in the middle of the floor, 
a slit of light. Why, someone's raising one of the stone slabs. Look, there's a hand. Catch his hands before he can put himself through the opening. Righto. Well done, you. Why, you've knocked him out. Good. Drag him up here. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll give us some light. Yeah, of course. That's better. But I say, Holmes, it, it's that Vincent Spaulding chap, Mr. Wilson's assistant. Spaulding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search him, Watson. Well, look out, Holmes. He's coming, too. Take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. Yeah, now, none of that. You, you may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. When you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs, sir, where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival? And be quick about it. spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thanks. Mm, feels good to get onto dry clothes again after sitting around in that cold cellar for hours. Not so much, Holmes. Do you want to drown me? <laughs> God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh. Oh, thank you. I say, Holmes, when, uh, when did you first begin to suspect that, that fellow Spaulding? I, I, I mean Clay. When Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind it. But, but uh, how did you guess what the motive was? In this case, I mean. I suspected his fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. By the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across in some time. Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes, but this is the first time we've come face to face. So you went around to have a look at the shop? At his trousers, Watson. At the knees of his trousers, to be exact. Uh? You saw how worn and wrinkled they were. They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where, then? We strolled round the corner, you remember, and there stood the city and suburban bank abutting our friend's pawn shop. Of course, yes. The influence was clear. Yes, but uh, how did you guess that he would make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson, perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed. But it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon, or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal, as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. And there you are. Your reasoning is perfect. A long chain, and yet every link rings true. Yeah, it saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the commonplaces of existence. Yes, after all, l'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand... Man is nothing. His work is everything. A fascinating story, Dr. Watson. What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I can't say I was ever bored. the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley.
Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the affair of the politician, the lighthouse, and the train cormorant. Harris speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.